I used to be scared of grafting. I used to think I was going to screw it up or mess it up or it looked too complicated. I would look at the little diagrams in a gardening book and say, no, nah, I don't think I can do that. And then I would go back to planting seeds. But a few years ago, I broke my fear of grafting and I jumped in with both feet and now I've grafted all kinds of things. I've done cross species grafting, I've done gorilla grafting, I've done grafts and seen them the next year fruit and produce more than the tree ever had before. And so over the next maybe hour or so, I'm gonna show you how to graft easily and tell you why you should graft and give you all kinds of great information and then hopefully you lose your fear as well and you'll be able to jump into it and you'll be grafting everything you can find. So let's get into it. So the question is, why would you want to graft? I mean, looking at it, you say, Grafting is supposed to be a form of propagation, but how does taking a piece off of one tree and sticking it onto another tree really propagate anything? Well, this is the way it works. The bottom part is your seed stock, right? Or your root stock. That's been started from seed or from cuttings or even from cloning possibly. And that has been selected to be strong and tough usually or to be resistant to nematodes as in the case of peaches or to be cold hardy or who knows what. But then you take that and then you graft on a desirable variety on the top. Now with roses you might do it because you wanted this amazing rose but it has sort of a weak root system. With fruit you might do it because you found a really productive tree and you want to propagate that tree and so you take a piece off of that and you put it onto an existing root stock. This right here is a loquat and this was started from seed. And I started in a little pot when it was about this big and planted it back here. Now it's taller than me and it's got an awesome rootstock. If I was to take another loquat and decide I was going to root it and plant it in here, I might have to wait a while for it to fruit. This right here from seed is a really healthy little tree. And so if I graft on top of this, all the hard work this tree has done, it might have roots eight or 10 feet away from the trunk at this point. All that hard work is going to get concentrated into whatever I graft on top which will give that graft the chance of making great fruit. Now, I don't know what this tree is going to fruit like. It's probably three years away from fruiting at this point because it's already, it's maybe three years in. So if I was to take another loquat that had really good fruit, I found a tree growing in the neighborhood and had great big sweet fruit on it, and graft into it, that piece thinks it's mature. That could be fruiting next year. And so we could skip a step and we could also take that and put it directly onto an established rootstock and get it growing really quickly. And this is why I tell people, plant trees from seeds, plant fruit trees from seeds. You can go plant the seeds of oranges, you can plant the seeds of grapefruits, you can plant apple seeds, you can plant pear seeds, you can plant mango seeds, you can plant whatever seeds you want. And people say, well, what happens if it doesn't bear good fruit? Well, it doesn't matter if it doesn't bear good fruit, really, because all you have to do when it gets big enough it's got a great root system because you started it from a seed and you put it in hopefully when it was pretty small. You can use that existing rootstock of that healthy tree and put something else on top of it. There's no loss. Say you waited six to eight years, you know, or 10 years for an apple tree from a seed to fruit. And then when you get the fruit, you're like, you know, this really isn't that impressive of an apple. Okay, no big deal. You cut into the trunk, you add in some pieces from an apple tree that is good and there you go. You'll be fruiting in a year or two and bearing whatever apple variety you picked. So there's not a loss. You've allowed it to grow in place and make an awesome root system. So that's one reason to graft. Uh, another reason to graft is to propagate your own varieties. Say you start a whole bunch of peaches from pits. I've shown people how to do this on my website. You know, how to germinate peach pits. Now some of those peach pits that germinate, you might get harder or rubbery peaches or not particularly sweet peaches or peaches that bloom at the wrong time and freeze or whatever. So what you do is you plant maybe 10 or 12 peach trees. And then out of those, when they start fruiting, they'll actually fruit in two or three years usually from peaches. When they start fruiting, you find, oh, this variety is so good, this variety is so-so, this variety is great. Oh, this one's cool because it's kind of reddish. I like that. So you take the ones that you like and you take pieces of them off and you graft them onto the ones that aren't very good. And that way you've got peach trees 
you know, you can rename it after yourself. It could be, you know, Jimmy's Red Peach, you know, Dave's Incredible Long Blooming Peach, whatever you wanted to do. And you've got a new variety of your own that you started from seed and you can propagate that variety in just over and over again. You can graft it into any peach tree. You can also intergraft peaches and nectarines. So there's a few reasons why you would want to graft. And now let's talk about what you can graft. This is a really good lemon tree. This is called a Meyer lemon. It's got a nice sweetness to it. It's very productive. This tree has made a couple hundred fruit this year. What can I graft this Meyer lemon onto? Well, I could graft it onto a grapefruit seedling. I could graft it onto a calamondin. I could graft it onto a key lime. I could graft it onto any citrus. The citrus intergraft pretty nicely. The only consideration is how big is that rootstock going to be and how big is this lemon going to be? For example, grapefruits grow like crazy. So if you decided you were going to make a fruit cocktail tree and you picked a key lime tree as your rootstock and you decided to graft on a grapefruit on one side and a navel on the other and maybe a lemon on the other, you would end up with a tree, the lemon tree growing off of one side and it only wants to get maybe 10 or 12 foot tall. Then you would have a grapefruit tree that's aiming for 30. Then you might have a navel that's aiming for about 20, 25. So you don't exactly necessarily want to start with a key lime tree and do that. You gotta think a little bit about what you're grafting onto and how big that tree really wants to get. Otherwise, you can still do it but you're gonna be trying to maintain it and you may have a big grapefruit branch growing off the side of this little key lime tree and it just collapse and rip off. But feel free to experiment anyways because it really doesn't cost you much except perhaps the original tree that you graft onto, which if you started from seed is no big deal. So if you do have a little rootstock, I would start with say a strong rootstock, like something right in the middle, like an orange and then just graft the smaller things on top of it and know that if you plant something that's really vigorous or, or graft in something really vigorous onto one side that you may have to control that through pruning which is a thing that you're going to deal with most fruit cocktail trees anyways. Now I said you can graft onto any citrus with citrus. They all work together pretty well. That's not the case with everything. You can take something like a wild black cherry and try to graft on a sweet cherry and it won't take. I know because this last spring I tried even though all the literature said you couldn't do it and I tried and it looked like it was going to grow a little bit and I thought maybe it was going to heal and work and then it died and fell off and the grafts have invariably died and fallen off when I've tried that. You can look at something like a stone fruit and say could I graft a peach onto a plum and the answer is often yes but if you try to graft a peach onto a sweet cherry it may not work. Sweet cherry might graft onto a sour cherry, but not the other way around. Sometimes you just don't really know and you can try and read and find compatibility charts. But if you have it in the same exact species, like peaches and nectarines are actually the same species, you can take a nectarine and graft it onto the side of a peach. You can take a peach and graft it onto the side of the nectarine, no problem. And they'll graft onto some of their cousins too. I found that uh, plums work, at least our wild Chickasaw plum, works well as a rootstock for both big fat cultivated plums which are a different species and peaches and nectarines which makes sense since they're both the same thing. This is pyracantha also known as firethorn and it's in the rose family. Now though most people probably wouldn't think of this apples, pears, peaches, plums, cherries, even strawberries and blackberries are all considered members of the greater rose family, rosaceae. This though this is one of the really cool cross-species grafts you can make. This is not known as an edible, though the berries when cooked can be made into jelly. It's known as a very beautiful ornamental and as a really thorny hedge. It's got little thorns all over it. But from my reading, you can also use it as a rootstock for loquat. Doesn't even seem like it would make sense, does it? They, they, they have like nothing in common in the way they look. Now if you do graft a loquat onto a pyracantha, you end up with a very dwarfed loquat. So you make it a loquat tree that's four to six foot tall instead of stretching up to 25, 30 foot. Um, I planted this pyracantha here along the fence 
with the idea that it would be a hedge that's an impenetrable barrier on one side and then on the inside I would graft on branches of loquats. Now there's another thing you can graft onto this. They're also a rootstock for pear. They're a proven rootstock. You can actually graft pear branches onto a pyracantha. So I can take pieces off of some of my sand pears, graft them onto the inside of this hedge. So you could pretty much have a dense hedge pointing out towards the street, all thorny, with berries all over it on that side, looking all pretty, but then being very dangerous if somebody decided to jump over into it. But on the inside, I could have branches of loquats and pears hanging into the yard that my kids could pick and maybe clocking in at around four to six foot. So some of the things you can do with grafting and cross species are unexpected. Let me show you the other cross species grafting that I've been doing and how well that's worked. This here, if you've watched my YouTube channel, is one of my successes in cross species grafting. Back here, this is one of our weedy Chickasaw plums, which forms thickets and makes kind of a sweet sour fruit, which is okay. It's good for animals, it's good for making some jam and jelly. Some of them are kind of sweet, some of them are lousy. But I grafted a improved variety of plum, which is a different species of plum. It makes great big purple fruit two years ago. Right there is the graft point, and it's healed together. So here up is Chickasaw plum. This is an improved plum variety. But that's not all I've done to this tree. Over here, this, about to burst into bloom, is nectarine. This nectarine was grafted on down here last spring. So this graft is really only a year old. And as you can see, it's a good, it's grown a good five foot easily. So this whole part right here is all nectarine grafted onto one of the suckers off of the Chickasaw plum. Now Chickasaw plums grow all over the place in my area. There are wild plums all over the woods. And that means if you had access to a nectarine tree and you had access to a piece of woods, you could simply take pieces in the spring of nectarine, go out into the woods and graft nectarines to your heart's content. The great thing about Chickasaw plum is the nematodes don't bother it. It grows in terrible soil. I've seen it in nasty sand in like rattlesnake scrub type country and it's growing like a boss. And if you decided to plant a nectarine or a peach out there, like I said before, the root stalks on some fruits are just not as good. Peaches are very susceptible to nematodes. So are nectarines because they're the same species. But this tree is not. This tree grows with no care. It grows in terrible conditions. Now, the, the reason they don't use Chickasaw plums in commercial grafting is because, as you can see, looking around here, it makes suckers all over the place. It's a really kind of gnarly tree that spreads out all over the ground. So what I've done is kind of made it into a fruit cocktail. There's a couple of peaches grafted on the back, a couple of nectarines over here, and then this beautiful plum right here, which has already borne a dozen fruit, and it's about to burst into bloom again. As you can see, there's buds all over it. It's gonna have an incredible amount of fruit. This tree, like I was saying with the key lime and grafting grapefruit on top, this is a small tree. Peaches and nectarines grow big, fat, and fast. They grow uh, very rapidly, as do the cultivated plums. So this gnarly little tree, when you graft onto it, the top part of the graft will grow faster than the Chickasaw plum. As you can see, it's a little thicker up here. You can really see it on the nectarine, how thick the nectarine piece is compared to the Chickasaw that's beneath it. That's Chickasaw up to there, and then suddenly it's nectarine, and it's grown like crazy. So when you've got this kind of willowy rootstock, it doesn't necessarily support the peaches or plums or whatever you want to graft on top with the same thickness of trunk and strength that uh, they really want. So what I've had to do is just, with, when the plums started forming on this thing, it just fell over. I just had to take a pole and nail it in the ground. And you can just do that. And on the home scale, you know, sticks a couple of fence posts next to them or whatever, just prop them up. This is just electrical conduit that I nailed a couple of feet deep into the ground and just give it something to hang on to. Very easy to just 
plug them in there. But again, this doesn't look like the way a commercial grove is supposed to look. So there you go. This is a cross species graft you can do. Now we get to the fun part. It's time to talk about how to graft. These tools here are more than you need to do grafting. But this is all I use, and I've really got it down to even simpler than this. But for starters, this pair of Felco pruners, these are really good. These are a Swiss-made pair of pruners. They're kind of expensive, but I've been using them now for a few years, and I use them in my plant nursery. They make a really nice cut. They're very well built. As you can tell, I've used them a lot. and. These are good for cutting your scion wood, which is what the pieces that you're going to be grafting into the rootstock are called, and for cutting off the rootstock to accept the scion. People will use uh, specific grafting knives. This is an Openel. It's a French knife. It's carbon steel. It's a really nice little gardening knife. They only cost like 12 or 13 bucks or something, but they're they're kind of cool. Uh, they're made in France, but. Um, you know, I used to be kind of thinking, oh, I just want to get a special grafting knife and I'm going to use this gardening knife. And I use this now as a pocket knife and I use it for some pruning and stuff here and there. But uh, I don't use it as much for grafting, even though I think it's a cool knife. Now what I use for grafting is just a simple utility knife. These razor blades are so perfect and give such a great cut. And they're so clean and that straight edge is really nice for making precise cuts that I figure, you know, I'll go with the $4 fixed. See, this is not the type that slides in and out. The fixed is better than that. If you got the type that rocks in and out, it gets a little wobble to the blade. It's not as good. It's still fine, though. Um, you can also use the type that breaks off. But anyhow, I figure if I can do something on the cheap like this for a few bucks, then why not use it? This here is called Parafilm. This is a waxy, stretchy tape. It actually bends and is really good at keeping out um, the dry air and allowing a graft to heal. You can use it and wrap the entire graft and wrap it right around buds, and the buds will actually grow through it. And so this is, this is actually quite handy, particularly when I'm grafting low quats, which are a little hard to manage sometimes. I love this parafilm tape. This stuff is about five or six bucks a roll, I think, on Amazon. I'll put a link to it. This is what I use for most of my graft tying off now. This is just called flagging tape, which is what they use at construction sites. It's a, I don't know what it's made out of, probably PVC or something. It's just a straight up, there we go. It's got some stretch to it, and I use it because you can just wrap it really, really, really tight around a graft, and it's often important to get things super tight around the edge so they hold together well and they don't get blown off and fall apart. So this um, flagging tape costs about $2 a roll. And I, I use it all the time in grafting. I'll often tie off the graft itself with flagging tape and then wrap it in parafilm. Or to use the last thing that I have here, this is wound sealer or tree sealer. This stuff is really nice. It's kind of like a black asphalt type of a tar. It's got a brush in the cap. And this keeps your cyan wood from drying out, which is one of the main reasons that grafts fail. So you can just paint this all over the whole surface and it keeps the moisture from escaping out of that cyan wood and out of the graft and it just facilitates the healing and keeps it from dying before it can grow together. So with just these six items, you're ready to graft. If you were gonna graft totally on the cheap, you could graft with a pocket knife, some Elmer's glue to use like the tree seal, and you could even use duct tape to hold the graft in place. You just have to tighten it up, make sure it's got a good fit, and make sure that it doesn't dry out and it'll take. Grafting doesn't have to be anything special. You don't have to have like a really great grafting knife or any kind of super system. You can start grafting for a few bucks, just so long as you have one tree that you want to graft onto, and another tree that's a donor. So now let's start looking at the actual cutting of the grafts.
All right, now I'm gonna show you how to do a whip and tongue graft. And we're gonna do this with cyan wood. Cyan wood is the pieces you cut off from this nectarine. And we're gonna graft that onto a peach in the backyard. And it's gonna look really cool when we're done because this nectarine has red leaves. The peaches have green leaves. So we're gonna have a Christmas tree. It's gonna be all red and green. So what I'm gonna do is take um, a piece down here. I think I'll take it right here. And this gives me enough cyan wood to do multiple grafts. All you need is a piece about that big to graft, but you can go even longer. My friend Steven has done pieces that are really long. They'll take so long as they don't dry out. So we can get a few grafts out of this one. Got another one off another nectarine tree. This is gonna be my cyan wood, as I said before. What I like to do to make sure it stays happy is to stick it in water while I'm gonna be out in the field because, again, the dangerous thing is having this dry out. Don't forget which way's up <laughs> when you do this. That wouldn't be good. Not that I speak from personal experience. I don't want the top part that's a little green, softer wood. Better to have the harder wood from lower down. There we go. Now we go over to the peach tree. This is the peach tree that we're going to graft onto. I've already grafted a few pieces of nectarine onto it. This branch here is all nectarine with red leaves, but it's not woken up yet. As you can see, the peach has these green leaves on it. It's very nice, beautiful green leaves. Over here is a piece of nectarine. Look at how red those leaves are. Isn't that amazing? So this here is going to bear nectarines. The rest of it's gonna be our peaches. Now, there's no real reason to do this other than that it's cool. You know, I want to add a few nectarines to my peach tree, so why not? We put some uh, pieces on there. So I did this uh, last year, and that one last year. This one was not really a strong graft. That one was a much stronger graft, and it's much, much bigger. So we'll just cut in here, and we'll throw a couple more pieces on just for fun, just so I can show you how this whip and tongue thing works. I'm going to take this branch here, just for fun, and I think I'll use this piece of cyan wood. So to do that, I'm gonna just clean this up first. And we wanna match that diameter up. It's right about there. Take this off. Don't want any buds or anything messing us up. So now we have our piece of cyan wood and we have our rootstock. So let's tack that sucker on there with a whip and tongue graft. You want to make a cut as simply as possible with as little whittling as possible to be a nice flat surface to receive the cyan. And it's not too bad angle that out a little more. Yes, I know, I'm whittling. You're not supposed to whittle, but <laughs> that's pretty close. Now we have to match this piece to that piece. Our cut starts right about here. Let's take this bud off.
now we have to cut the notch in. This is the tongue part. This is a little tricky. But it helps hold it together better. There we go. Now we do the same thing here. And we want these two to fit together. I bend it up a little bit with the edge of the knife. Now the two tongues need to fit together. Make sure that cambium all sits together nicely. There we go, that will work. Now we're going to wrap this baby with our flagging tape. And I want it tight, tight, tight. in there real good. Very important. It's probably a prettier way to tie it, but I'm a bit of a redneck. Now it's important to make sure that that doesn't dry out. So I just goop the wound sealer over it. Making sure that I'm getting it on the rootstock and getting it up on the cyan wood all the way around so no air is going to get in there. And then it's very important to seal the tip up here. So make sure that that doesn't allow moisture to come out until it heals up nicely. Now we've got multiple buds that can emerge when this heals. When you see those buds start growing, don't go taking your tape or anything off, just let them grow. But they are, if this graft takes, your buds are gonna start growing usually in a few weeks as the tree continues to wake up out of its winter dormancy. But that's it, that is a whip and tongue graft sealed off, ready to go, and now we can go on and take a look at another type of graft. The next type of graft I'm going to show you is called a side veneer graft. This is really a good graft for loquats, and I learned it from my friend Oliver, who's probably much better at it than I am. As a matter of fact, he gave me this variety of improved loquat. A lot of the loquats you see are seedling varieties, and they're often planted as a landscape tree just because they're beautiful and they're evergreen. So you'll get seedling varieties which make, you know, somewhat sour fruits. They're often pretty good. Uh, it's a good fruit no matter whether it's seedling or not, but they're not as awesome as some of the improved varieties. This variety Oliver has named Shambhala, and it is a long blooming variety. It starts blooming in the fall and just kind of keeps blooming on through the spring, which means if we get a late frost, it keeps blooming and will produce fruit even after the frosts. So it's, it's really kind of a cool tree to have, particularly where I am and we get frosts often into March. So I'm going to take some cyan wood off of this tree and graft it onto a seedling using a side veneer graft and I'm going to show you how to do that. So come up here and take a closer look at what this proper scion wood looks like. 
All right, right here, if you could see on the end, this is not brand new growth. This is a bud that's getting ready to grow, maybe a little too ready to grow, but it's pretty close. And it's not burst into brand new bright green growth. This is hardened off for the most part. There's some woodiness to this stem. You don't want the brand new growth because it tends to dry out and doesn't heal well and doesn't take. So I'm gonna take this piece down here. And now that's our piece of cyan wood. And then nip off the leaves. Each one of these leaves is a place that water can escape. So you don't wanna leave all the leaves on. You want to nip them off. There you go. There's our scion wood. We've got plenty to work with. And we can graft this onto a seedling and make it take. I have this little seedling loquat here and I'm matching up the size of this scion to the rootstock. And I'm not gonna take the top of this tree off. With the side veneer grafting, you don't do that. And if it fails, you can just do it again. But it allows the tree to keep feeding itself via the solar energy coming in through the leaves and heal up without the damage of taking the entire top of the seedling off. You can see here that this scion is pretty close to the same diameter as here. We want to make sure that that cambium layer underneath matches up appropriately on both sides, hopefully, and we're pretty close. So you're going to take this and make a cut inwards on a diagonal straight down the side of the tree in a little bit to open up a patch that you're gonna tie into. There we go. And now I cut inwards to meet that piece and we just take that entire piece out. There we go. And we're gonna do the same thing on this and try to make the match. Fortunately, loquats are really easy. <laughs> They're not hard to do this with. They heal better than a lot of trees do. So we want those two pieces to fit together. You see that? Now it's important at this point to make sure that that stays lined up. So we're gonna take our parafilm tape right here and wrap it around. You want to get it tight. Parafilm is kind of cool because it sticks to itself. Now that we have the bottom part, you want to wrap it up as well to keep it from drying out. This parafilm tape is stretchy enough and it will break when the buds grow through it, which is kind of cool. So you just wrap it to keep the moisture in.
Okay. I'll leave the top there. I wrap it down again from the top so the water doesn't come in. It kind of runs off better that way. There we go, and that should heal in a couple of weeks, and then this top should start to push out of there. But keep the plant well watered and cared for. If you have a greenhouse, you can put it in the greenhouse. You can even put a tent of a plastic bag over it with some sticks holding it up to keep it from touching on these leaves if you want to make the moisture level higher, which will help the graft heal. But you don't have to worry about it all that much. Most of the time they take There we go, that's the side veneer graft. Here's one more thing on the side veneer graft. If you don't feel like you made a very good cut and you think that it's not sticking together in there all that well, you can always cheat it by taking a little bit of your flagging tape and really pulling it tight. So you've got a really, really tight connection. Because again, you've really just got to get that cambium sticking together. And this is totally rednecking it, and it's ugly and all that stuff, but it doesn't really matter. We're not doing commercial fruit tree grafting here, and nobody's going to judge you or grade you. So if you feel like maybe it's not tight enough, you can always wrap around again, give it a few more loops, and there you go. Okay, that's as tight as I'm gonna get it. Ta-da! So, you know, that, that'll just push those two sides together and make them stick, that's the idea. I think it would have been fine already, but it's fun to just show you how to do that. Mm. The next graft I'm gonna show you how to do is called a cleft graft. And this is where you have a larger rootstock and you want to graft in some small cyan wood say you only have little pieces so you're gonna you could actually cut a tree down and graft little pieces of wood into the even the trunk of the tree and it will create a new top from that so the cleft graft is really kind of a cool one so i'm going to take apples and show you how to do it because they have taken better for me than most of the trees that i've cleft grafted so this apple here is a variety i'm going to add on Take this piece, it's got a little bit of new growth here, but apples are very confused in general in Florida, so I'm not going to worry about it too much. Just take the end of it off, uh, and then we'll take these two pieces and we will graft them into a rootstock apple. This is an Anna apple tree, which is a Florida variety, but I have some pink fleshed apples, and that's what I just took cyan wood off of. They were given to me by my friend Stephen, who's been breeding apples. What I do first is just clean this area up a little bit, and I'm just gonna change this section of the tree. So I'll take my piece off, and that's where I'm gonna do my cleft graft. I'm gonna cut right through the center here carefully down into the tree and the trick is don't damage the bark it's the bark is the part that's going to heal together so now that that's opened up I'm going to take these ends and cut them into wedges and then they're gonna stay inside there, lined up to the tree as best as we can make it happen. So 
can see that a little edge there careful and that cyan wood's got to stick together where it's touching right there is where it'll heal that's not a pretty piece I'll get a little further in there a little cleaner there we go and that one sticks in the other side I know that looks bizarre, but it will actually heal that way, believe it or not, and work, provided these don't get jarred out of here and that they don't dry out. Let's pull it tightly around here. Real tight. want those suckers to stick. Now, take my handy dandy tar gunk coat that sucker up. Biggest problem with these is that they dry out. Don't let them dry out. Just pack it all in there. Make sure it's not exposed at all. Also, I do the ends of the scions because we don't want them to dry out and they will dry out quickly I'm gonna paint these up a little bit too just to make sure because it's dry this time of year I'll leave a couple of buds unpainted but it's good to get this as covered as possible there you go. It may not be beautiful, but that is a small cleft graft. Now I'm going to show you what a healed cleft graft looks like so you can kind of get an idea of what this tree is going to do. I'll show you one that we did last year. This here is a healed cleft graft. You can see how it's bumped out and joined. The bark grows together and it grows the wood. Well, the, the cambium layer grows the bark on the outside and the wood on the inside and it makes a knot around it and heals it up. And then next thing you know, it's grown into a whole new top for the tree. I did this last spring, or actually late winter, and it's just completely taken and looks good. Let's say you've got some cyan wood left or that you want to share with somebody else, or you want to graft it later and you're afraid that all the trees are going to wake up and you're going to miss your chance to cut cyan wood. Take those cyans and simply put them in a Ziploc bag and you can keep them in your refrigerator. You don't have to soak them in water, you don't have to put in wet paper towels, you don't have to get them sopping wet or anything else, you just have to put them away. Then when you do graft them, Cut these ends off again for a fresh cut and go ahead and graft. But you could ship them through the mail this way. Uh, if you really are worried about them drying out, you could spritz them with water really good, you know, and then shake all the water off, pat them down, and then stick them in. But uh, they'll keep this way for months in your fridge usually. I've had mulberry cyan wood keep for six months or more in the fridge, which is ridiculous. Usually you're good for a few weeks. Finally, if you're afraid 
of grafting still. You look and you say, I don't really want to cut into any of my fruit trees and run this risk. Here's how you can lose your fear of grafting completely. This mulberry tree here is just about to wake up and I've got to do a little pruning on it. I want to take some of these middle branches out of the center here. So, I'm going to take some of them. All right, now, look at all this wood. I could take this to my back porch, sit down with a razor knife, and start whittling and practicing different grafts. If I wanted to practice a cleft graft, I could take this big chunk here and put a couple of little pieces into it. If I want to do a whip and tongue, I could take these, cut them apart, and then graft them back together. Let's go sit down and do it. your fear of grafting. Go ahead, practice, go out in the yard, try these little simple grafts, and enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. It allows you to do things you never thought you could do before. It allows you to take useless trees and convert them into wonderful trees, and it's just fun. You will have entered the next level when you learn how to graft, and I think by the end of this film you've pretty much learned how to do it. Now you just need to go outside, lose your fear, and do it. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you in the future and at thesurvivalgardener.com. Pull it tightly. Oops. <laughs>